Hello students, welcome to the lecture on carbohydrates. This is a short and simple lecture where my intention is to introduce you to the key concepts that we will be going through when we study carbohydrate metabolism. Hence, following this lecture, you should be able to define what is a monosaccharide, define what is a disaccharide, and also able to define what is a polysaccharide. You should be able to provide me with an overview of glucose metabolism, highlighting the important pathways that participate in the process of glucose metabolism. You should be able to discuss and describe the key facets regarding organ-specific metabolism of glucose, you should be able to narrate the mechanistic aspects regarding the transport of glucose inside the cell and this particular topic you will need your textbook to read certain points which I have indicated and at the end we have a list of clinically relevant information regarding specific metabolites derived from carbohydrates which I have prepared using the book Harrison's Internal Medicine. And I'm not going to read through the slide that contains this clinically relevant information. You should read it when you go through the slides along with this recording. So let us try to define what is a carbohydrate. The meaning of the car word carbohydrate is watered carbon and most carbohydrates have the formula CN H2O whole N. Let us take the most important carbohydrate that you will encounter in your course in enzymes and metabolism that is glucose and you will see here that glucose has six carbons with six water molecule. Therefore, the formula of glucose is 6 C6H12O6. Now, you have to remember also that not all carbohydrates have the formula CNH2O whole N. An exception to this rule are the deoxy sugars and the amino sugars. The deoxy sugars you will encounter when you study the structure of DNA in the molecular biology course that you will take in phase two of the medical curriculum. Now let us move on to monosaccharides. Now monosaccharides are the simplest carbohydrates since they cannot be hydrolyzed to smaller carbohydrates. Now, monosaccharides can be further classified according to three different characteristics. The location of the carbonyl group, the number of carbon atoms they contain. For example, glucose contains six carbon atoms, hence glucose is called a hexose. Their chiral property, this particular aspect I am not going to go through and I am sure Professor Bayumi will be covering this when he talks about isomerism in carbohydrates. And also for the boards, I do not think this particular aspect is important. Now if the, car if the carbonyl group in the monosaccharide is an aldehyde, then we call it an aldose. So this is glucose molecule and you can see here it has an aldehyde functional group. By now you know what a functional group is. So glucose contains an aldehyde functional group. Therefore glucose is an aldose. If you want to be more specific, since glucose contains six carbon atoms, and an aldehyde functional group, we call it an aldohexose. Similarly, if we look at fructose, it has 
a ketone functional group but has six carbon atoms therefore fructose is a ketose or more speci specifically a ketohexose. In the course of biochemistry the three monosaccharides that we will need to focus on are glucose, galactose and fructose. And if you carefully look at the structure of these three monosaccharides you will find that all of them have the same molecular formula but different spatial orientation around the six carbons. Hence glucose, galactose and fructose are isomers of each other. In the course of biochemistry we will be talking about monosaccharides when we study the different pathways related to the metabolism of glucose, galactose and fructose. For example, when we study glycolysis, we will be talking about dihydroxyacetone which is a ketose and an important metabolite produced in the glycolytic pathway. Similarly, when we talk about the pentose phosphate pathway, we will talk about ribulose and ribose both of which are pentose monosaccharides and in case of ribose as you can see here in this table they are important component in the formation of nucleic acids which are RNA and DNA. However in the course of biochemistry as well as for the boards we need to focus on the metabolism of glucose fructose and galactose and a significant part of the course will be dedicated to discuss, discussing and describing the metabolic metabolism of glucose and the concerned pathways involved in this metabolic process. Now we come to disaccharides. What are disaccharides? As you can understand from the word di, it means two. So disaccharides are the condensation products of two monosaccharides. An example is sucrose or table sugar, which you put in your coffee when you are taking it in DXB blends. It consists of monosaccharides glucose and fructose. Disaccharides are broken down to monosaccharides in the GI tract and these monosaccharides are then absorbed for further metabolism. The two most important disaccharides that you will encounter in the biochemistry course are lactose which consists of galactose and glucose and the enzyme that is involved in the breakdown of lactose is lactase. And you may have heard that some individuals are lactose intolerant because they lack the enzyme lactase. The second disaccharide that I already mentioned fleetingly is sucrose which consists of monosaccharide fructose and glucose. The enzyme responsible for breaking down sucrose is sucrase. Now we come to polysaccharides. Now when we talk about polysaccharides, the simplest way to define polysaccharides are polymers of monosaccharides. And these polysaccharides are classified based on the number of sugar units that they contain. We already talked about disaccharides which contain two monosaccharides. If a particular polysaccharide consists of 3 to 10 monosaccharide molecules then 
we call that oligosaccharide. And anything that has above 10 monosaccharide molecules, we call them polysaccharides. And the most important polysaccharide that we will study in the course of biochemistry is glycogen. We will also talk about glycosaminoglycans in next week's lecture. Now let us talk about some of the important polysaccharides. The first one is starch. Now starch is a plant polysaccharide that consists of glucose polymers. Then we have glycogen which is an important polysaccharide that you will encounter in the course of biochemistry and glycogen can be broken down by the body in times of need to produce glucose which can be then used in the production of sorry about that, which can be then used in the production of energy. The third important polysaccharide is cellulose. Now, cellulose is a plant polysaccharide which consists of glucose molecules. However, the bonding of glucose in cellulose is different from that of starch. Now, the most important thing to note here is that cellulose cannot be broken down by animals. Now, when we talk about fiber in the diet, we are talking about cellulose which cannot be broken down by the human body. However, it adds to the bulk to our stool and improves bowel function, especially in the elderly with the condition known as constipation. Therefore, it is often recommended people suffering from constipation take cellulose, which is a plant polysaccharide that cannot be broken down by the body. Now, when we talk about metabolism of carbohydrate, or specifically the catabolism of carbohydrate, we are actually talking about breaking carbohydrates or polysaccharides more precisely into glucose, fructose and galactose. So most of our course will tackle the metabolism of glucose, but we will also have separate lectures on fructose and galactose metabolism. Now let us get a quick overview of glucose metabolism. As I said previously, glucose metabolism is a topic that we will deal in detail. So first, glucose can be converted to lactate by anaerobic metabolism and we will talk about the process or the pathway where this conversion happens that is the conversion of glucose to lactate and this particular pathway is the glycolytic pathway glucose can also be metabolized aerobically through the tcs cycle and through the tcs cycle in association with the electron transport chain we produce water and the energy currency of the cell that is ATP. Glucose is also metabolized by the hexose monophosphate shunt or the pentose phosphate pathway to produce ribose that forms an important constituent for the synthesis of nucleic acids and also NADPH and we will talk about the clinical as well as physiological significance of NADPH when we study hexose monophosphate shunt 
or the pentose phosphate pathway. Glucose through the process of fatty acid synthesis can also be converted to fatty acids and this process as we shall see later during the lecture happens mostly in the adipose tissues. Excess amount of glucose is converted to glycogen by the process of glycogenesis and I mentioned this when we talked about polysaccharide especially animal polysaccharide glycogen. Glycogen can be broken down by the process of glycogenolysis to glucose in times of need when the body requires to generate ATP and doesn't have access or ready access to glucose. Let us now quickly go through the organ specific metabolism of glucose. And this is important because in your biochemistry course we will be talking about metabolism of glucose in these organs in detail, especially when Professor Bayumi talks to you about integration of metabolism. First is the liver. The liver has the most varied use of glucose. First, it can metabolize glucose using the TCA cycle or the tricarboxylic acid cycle, also known as the Krebs cycle, to produce ATP. If there is an excess of glucose, it can also help to store glucose by converting glucose to glycogen by the process of glycogenesis or glycogen synthesis. Now we come to the brain. The brain has a constant use of glucose to produce ATP. It metabolizes glucose using the tricarboxylic acid cycle. The most important point to note here is that little glucose can be stored in the, in the brain in the form of glycogen. Hence, rest of the body will often work hard to provide the brain with the necessary supply of glucose. Now we come to the two other cells that are important for you to know and these cells are the muscle and the heart. In the muscle, glucose is converted or metabolized to produce ATP through the TCA cycle. The transport of glucose into the muscle is heavily influenced by the hormone insulin. And this is important for you to note because again this will be an important point to discuss when Prof. Riyadh teaches integration of metabolism. When the environment contains more insulin, there is more glucose uptake. Muscle is also able to store excess glucose in the form of glycogen where glucose is converted to glycogen by the process of glycogenesis. Now, in your course and each year I need to identify this particular aspect is the metabolism in red blood cells. Red blood cells do not have mitochondria and this you should note specifically. Since red blood cells do not have mitochondria, they can only metabolize glucose anaerobically to generate ATP. Anaerobic metabolism of glucose leads to the production or generation of lactate. This lactate is circulated back to the liver where it is converted to glucose. Red blood cells also use glucose for hexose monophosphate shunt to generate NADPH. And this production of NADPH is important for the red blood cells to maintain homeostasis 
and this we will look at in detail when we talk about the hexose monophosphate shunt. In the adipose tissue, glucose, as I mentioned previously, is converted to fatty acids. Like muscle, glucose uptake by adipose tissue is heavily influenced by insulin. And this aspect again will be discussed in detail by Professor Bayumi when he talks about integration of metabolism. As I mentioned, part of this lecture is dedicated to the transport of glucose. <clears throat> if I want to classify the transport of glucose into the cells, we can classify them into two types. The first type is sodium independent entry, which is prevalent in most of the tissues. So what happens? There is a particular transmembrane protein called glucose transporter, which is able to draw glucose across a concentration gradient. And I have shown this in this particular part of the slide. <clears throat> when I mention across a concentration gradient, what I want to identify here is that it draws glucose from a region of high concentration to a region of low concentration. 14 different transporters have been described and they are identified from glucose transporter 1 to glucose transporter 14. And depending on the tissue, we can get a specific type of glucose transporter. For example, in the red blood cells, we get the glucose transporter type 1. As I mentioned, you will require your textbook when you are going through this particular part of the lecture. So please refer to your textbook and read this particular part. The edition that you will require for this is already uploaded as a soft copy on the learning management system. The second type, which is restricted to specific tissues, is the sodium dependent entry of glucose. A point to note here is that in sodium dependent entry, glucose is absorbed from low to high concentration. And this particular type of transport is observed in intestinal epithelium and the renal tubules. Let us take the exemplar of renal tubules or how glucose is transported in the renal tubules. As you can see here, in the renal tubules, there is a transporter which is a transmembrane protein called sodium glucose co-transporter. What is a co-transporter? A co-transporter will transport one molecule of glucose along with one molecule of sodium. So here you see here, this is the luminal side. So glucose is transported inside the cell along with one sodium atom. As the concentration of glucose builds up inside the cell, glucose is transported by glucose transporter across a concentration gradient where we see the involvement of glucose transporter which is sodium independent transport of glucose and the type of glucose transporter that mediates this particular transport of glucose from the cell to the basolateral side is glucose transporter 2 or GLUT2. 
as we are transporting glucose by the sodium glucose co-transporter, the concentration of sodium is going up. Therefore, we need to bring it down. So what happens? We have a sodium potassium ATPase and this particular transporter transports glucose, uh, sodium to the basolateral side and for each sodium atom, the cell takes up one potassium atom. However, a point to note here is that the transport of sodium which is taking place here is an active process which requires energy. Therefore, this particular transporter has ATPase activity whereas potassium passively crosses the cell membrane into the basolateral side. So this gives you an idea of sodium dependent entry of glucose into the cell. Again, you will require your book and I have indicated the section that you should read once you have gone through the recording as well as through the slides. And if you have any difficulty, doubts or clarification that you require, please let me know. Now, as I mentioned in the objective of this lecture, I have highlighted certain aspects that are clinically relevant that you should remember. And this list I have prepared using the book of Harrison's Internal Medicine. Please go through this and if you have any difficulty, please let me know when we have the live session. With that, I will like to thank you for your attention. Take care of yourself and take care of others and have a very nice day. Thank you very much.